this person is known as the growth guy. He is the founder of the world-renowned Entrepreneurs Organization, you know it as EO, and he's also the CEO of a global executive education and coaching company known as Gazelles. He's a global syndicated columnist of fortune. He's the author of three books. The newest is Scaling Up. He is about money. He is about success. He is about growth. And he's here on this stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Vern Harnish, give it up! Oh, yeah! You know, what's interesting, it takes about 25 years in order for a company to really hit its inflection point. You know, he launched in 1976, and by 2001, now 9,600 employees is decent, but it's, you know, it's hardly putting a dent in the universe. And it was really when he launched the iPod that everything else happened. So, quick question, if we could, let's have the lights up for the rest of our presentation here. I wanna see a show of hands. How many of you guys have been in business for less than 25 years? I wanna see a show of hands. All right, you still have time, <laughs> all right? Now, those of you over 25 years, you know, it's, it's exciting. You know, so uh, Jim Collins has been a dear friend. And Jim's research is clear that our most productive time is over 50. In fact, Peter Drucker wrote twice as many books over 50 than he did before. And so we have time as well. So there's been my passion. For 33 years, just how do we get these companies to scale up? We know, we know that this journey, as you begin to scale up your particular business, can be tough. I mean, it literally feels like at times you're the only one carrying the entire weight up that S-curve. So I want to take our framework, and I want to share five very practical ideas, five decisions that you absolutely have got to get right if you're gonna go ahead and scale it at whatever it is that you plan on doing. And so first, what is the most important question you've got to own? Number two, what are the two words that you absolutely must own in the marketplace? Number three, how do I decide what I focus on next? And then number four, what is the ultimate truth if we are gonna put that pile of cash together? And then along the way, I wanna share some kind of critical routines that I think are helpful. Now, I want to get into this first practical idea, and that is around the question. And in every one of us, we anchor our scaling up people. Would you enthusiastically continue to work with all the people you've got around you? And one of the things that I have learned in the 33 years of being out there in business is that you have to avoid the a-holes, for sure. Because they will waste so much of your time along the way. By the way, they said there's no I in team. They found it. It's hidden in the A-hole, right there. Sure enough. And one of the things that absolutely I know, I've learned it gets in my way, gets in the way of our clients, is this three-letter word called ego, E-G-O. Because one of the things in the 21st century that I think we all have to come to grips with is that you are absolutely not smart enough alone to drive up your business. The entire intellectual capital of your team is not sufficient. I remember when we decided we needed to get global. And so we needed to just update our CRM system. I needed something in the cloud that would really work for us around the globe. And so my IT team that we outsource in India had put together over five weeks this unbelievable Excel spreadsheet that listed 24 CRM systems. I didn't even know that many existed. And we're starting to pour through the features and benefits, and they're telling us it's going to take us another five weeks. And I realized it was literally screaming in my head Jim's words. And I said, who do I know? that knows more about this in a little pinky than they do in our entire being. I said, ah, Jim Cecil. I know Jim up in Seattle, the nurture guru. Uh, I, know, I know Jeffrey Moore. And I quickly sent off emails to both of them. I said, look, guys, you know my business. Here's the spreadsheet I'm staring at blindly. Which should we choose? And independently and within minutes, they both emailed back and suggested the exact same CRM system. And that decision was made in three minutes so I put out this book called Scaling Up last year, and I actually thought that was a great looking cover. It was black and white, it was thick, and I put it out to about 500 of our world. They basically said my baby was both ugly and stupid. 
It hurt, man. It hurt. And so that's what the crowd created. And we've been real proud of how well it's done. And so what are you going to do to tap in to a whole lot more brains in order to scale up your business. Now, I wanna get to strategy. And our key question there is, can you state your strategy simply? Again, I was down in Australia and I saw this. We are number one in the number two business. <laughs> now, as Jeffrey introduced, I am known as the growth guy. And by the way, how do you know if you own a couple of words? You go to the search engines, any place on the planet, and you put those two words and you see if you own that critical, viable real estate. And I do. The problem is this, nobody searches for it. <laughs> I mean, when's the last time anyone's sitting around saying, man, I need a growth guy? <laughs> Un unless it's like Viagra related, and that ain't my deal, guys. That's not my deal. And so I screwed up. You know, they often say, you know, no one's worthless. They can at least serve as a bad example, and that has been me. <laughs> now, we think we know the two words we need to own, and we're getting about it. But you got to figure this out. Let's now shift to execution. And there it's all about relentless repeatability. And it's about keeping the main thing the main thing. The problem is easy to say, but how the heck do I figure that out? So I want to tell you a story about Mark. And so he's getting ready to take the company public in 2012. But that December, he wakes up in a cold sweat like the rest of us and says, Oh my God. We are about to screw up. We have missed the most important trend on the planet, and that's people aren't using their, their PCs anymore. They have switched to, to mobile. And Facebook and all the competitors had not made the switch. So every quarter, one of the routines, he puts up a big white tent, and all their employees are required to attend. At the time, he had 3,200 employees. He had 2,000 local, 1,200 around the globe. And they're all thinking he's there to announce the fact that we're going to be focused on this pending IPO. By the way, that's a pretty big thing to do, to go public. Yet he hardly mentioned it in passing. What he said to his team was, what I need you to do, I'll handle that distraction, what I need you to do is I need you to laser focus, keep your head down, continue to focus, and deliver and get us mobile. Now, in the meantime, he gets public. $38, within a few months, the stock literally crashes in half. Even as a writer for Fortune, we're sitting there beating him up. Maybe the boy wonders luster is gone. But he kept focused. And the rest is history. Even Facebook has limited time, limited resources, limited effort. Like everyone else sitting here in this audience. And what you have to do is always, always, apply your effort to that constraint. Now, I'm not talking about problems. We are not a company that's about solving problems. We'd rather go after what's working and do more of that. No, this is about the constraint that's out there. And if you don't focus your energy on what's constraining the growth of your, your speaking business, whatever it is next, you're spinning your wheels. And by the way, often who will help you fix that constraint is the right who, built around owning the two words in the marketplace that will build your brand. When Steve Jobs realized the next constraint was retail, that nobody could retail his products like he could, he said, we gotta get in the retail business. Just like he figured out iTunes was the real constraint. He needs to control the distribution of music and the hardware manufacturer to go that direction and then go to retail is crazy. But it was all driven around a very, very simple decision. Where's the constraint? So then he set up a mock retail store and for three hours every day, dragging his friend Larry Ellison over there on the weekends. In six months, when they launched, everybody was just blown away that they'd created the largest, most successful retail store on the planet. It doesn't happen by accident. So how do we convert this all into cash? How are we gonna make literally a ton of money legitimately out there, all right? <laughs> If you want to make a ton of money, here is the ultimate, ultimate truth. You have to give away 200 pounds. So I want to tell you a story. I, um, so I launched Gazelles in 1996 uh, on the eve of the birth of our, our first son, Cameron. And I, it was a great ride. We took it from a half million to a million to two million to four million, getting ready to go to eight million. I'm going to be an Inc. 500 company. And then 9-11 hit, and it slapped us silly. 
And I literally lost a million bucks in eight weeks. We almost lost our home. I had to let all the team go at just before Thanksgiving. My only positive was, well, now you at least have the holiday month off. You know, you try to generate <laughs> whatever positivity you can. I came home to Julie, and I'm, I'm telling you, we are in trouble. But I said, look, I, I trust this universal truth. And we committed to donate over the next 36 months the largest chunk of change I had ever even conceived I would give away. And you know what? It worked. And it was crazy. What I'd actually committed to give away in 2002, I ended up taking to the bottom line 10 times that. But it was ultimately this guy, John Whitehead. And I had a chance to serve on a board for many, many years with John. And at one of the board meetings, I pulled John aside and said, John, what have you learned in life? And he, he thought about it, and then he said, you know what, to always do a little bit of retail business every day. And he said, let me explain that. He said, you know, as co-chairman of Goldman Sachs, you know, you got the big office and all that stuff, but I always made sure I went down to the trading floor to see if there was somebody, one of our new employees, that could use some help. When I became de Deputy Secretary of State, I told my staff that as busy as I was, Bring me one person every day who was in trouble, a, a couple who had lost their passports in Paraguay and just needed somebody in government to pull a string and help them. One of the most important routines, at least for me over the last decade, was to make sure I carve out 30 minutes to 45 minutes every day and go help somebody who's asked for help. And that, because he ultimately it only comes when you give first. And so, let me wrap up here. First, who's the top 25 that's gonna help you scale up the business? Number two, what are those two words or a few words, the idea, the space that you can absolutely own? Number three, then, as you're trying to scale up, it's always focusing your effort where the constraint is. And then the ultimate lesson around cash is, man, you gotta give it before it comes. You gotta give before you take. Now we talked about the critical routine of learning, but I wanna share just one last one. And this comes from Marshall Goldsmith. And I gotta tell you, this has transformed me and my team and our clients more than any other idea I can share with you. And that was important that so you cannot do this thing alone, that you need what he calls a peer coach, not a mentor. I got all kinds of mentors and always have been privileged and blessed to have that. But this is someone different. This is a peer. This is my friend, Sebastian Ross who ultimately, it comes down, if you wanna be a better father, better husband, and a better leader of your business, it comes down to what you're gonna do more or less of on a daily basis. And so at the end of the day, to keep scaling, it requires these three things. NSA, thank you so much. <laughs>